Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Warner Allen, and I am the poor substitute for Lynn Snodgrass, who is the CEO, as she says, of the best darn chamber in the Northwest. Uh, but she's not able to be here today, and so I got drafted. Um, I do want to thank you all for coming today, uh, and especially want to thank you or thank uh, our presenting sponsors. Welcome back, uh, Portland General Electric. Uh, and our new presenting sponsor, Columbia Bank, Robin Dodge Little, thank you. Um, thank you to our stakeholder sponsor, Gresham Barlow School District, and of course, Metro East Community Media. Thank you, Keith. Um, just as a reminder, uh, replay schedules are on the registration table, so um, if you didn't catch it all and want to review it, you'll have that opportunity. Um, I'd also like to recognize the chamber board members who are here today. Um, our current president, Jim Hathaway, with Transamerica Financial Advisors, and moi. <laughs> so we're the representatives, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so it is um, with great pleasure that I also take this opportunity to introduce you to John Charles Mr. Charles was named President and CEO of the Cascade Policy Institute in 2005. Cascade is a free market think tank working to promote individual liberty, economic opportunity, and personal responsibility. John Charles initially joined Cascade in 1997 as an environmental policy director. His research has focused on transportation, land use, and free market environmentalism. He's a frequent keynote speaker and guest lecturer, especially on the subject of growth management, and has traveled to 24 states to discuss this issue. Mr. Charles authored a chapter on the Portland experience in the book, A Citizen's Guide to Smart Growth, co-published by the Heritage Foundation and Property and Environmental Research Center. He has also been published in newspapers around the country, including the Oregonian, Pittsburgh Times Review, the Hartford Courant and the Seattle Times. Prior to joining the Institute, Mr. Charles was Executive Director of the Oregon Environmental Council for 17 years. During that time, he served on dozens of local, state, and federal commissions and advisory boards related to environmental protection. Charles was also an active participant in the Oregon legislative uh, proceedings and helped author numerous environmental statutes in the areas of forest management, toxic substances, air pollution, watershed restoration, and transportation. Today's topic is transportation. He did not take Max or TriMet to get here. His research on all things transportation is well known to the Pacific Northwest. Please welcome our speaker, Mr. John Charles. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me, and uh, let me let me share your lunchtime while we talk about some transportation issues in the Portland region. <clears throat> I should say, as a preface, I'm, I'm glad that you uh, mentioned my uh, background prior to Cascade Policy Institute. I, I have sort of a strange career path. I spent the first 20 years of my career working for environmental organizations, and the last 21 years working for a free market think tank which is not what I planned. Most people probably wouldn't plan that. <clears throat> but it does mean that um, when I speak to an audience, most of what they might be thinking about a policy issue, I probably either think about, think the same way now, or I used to think that way. So I do tend to ha understand why people believe in certain things. <clears throat> and for Cascade, I mean, we are a free market research center. Just so you know, we, we take in and spend about a million dollars a year, all from private donations. We don't accept any government money, nor would we solicit any. We're in our 27th year, and um, we publish papers and uh, 
give speeches and invite speakers in on all kinds of topics related to uh, health care, education, transportation, tax and, tax and budget, anything that we think is of interest to Oregonians. We're not that interested in the national or international scene, mostly because we don't think anybody is waiting by some phone um, 3,000 miles away to take our phone call. It's probably also true that there's no one down in the governor's office waiting by a phone to take my phone call either, but we do feel we have probably a slight chance of influencing policy at the state level. And at the table in the back, there are all kinds of policy papers and <coughs> books. Anything that's on the table, you are welcome to take. We frequently get <clears throat> multiple copies of books, and they're not doing me any good in my office. If, if the topics are of interest to you, please take them. And uh, <clears throat> finally, some people frequently do want to know, well, why would you work for a liberal environmental, two environmental organizations for 20 years, and then go work for this libertarian think tank. <clears throat> and there actually is a long answer to that, which is not the topic of today's speech, but I wrote an essay in this book called Why, the book itself is Why We Left the Left. There's 25 essays in there, and mine is one of them. And I'll leave the book with you before I go. And anybody who is interested in my own intellectual journey from a, a very liberal person to a, more of a libertarian, uh, it's, it's all in the book. So. Uh, I'll say to start about the <clears throat> broader transportation region, the fact that congestion is a very frustrating part of daily life and that in most respects it's getting worse. The fact that we have a large monopoly called TriMet that takes in a large and growing amount of tax revenue each year and yet their ridership peaked seven years ago and is in a free fall, mostly due to a market-based success story called the ride-hailing revolution, <clears throat> known to some of you as Lyft and Uber. Uh, if you want to know why we only have two bridges from Portland to Vancouver and have had only two since 1982, and why there is no plan to provide a third, fourth, or fifth bridge, even though there might be a demand for that. It's not an accident. It's by design. Okay, that is the plan. So if you're waiting for the Calvary to come and rescue you, or if you're merely waiting for a new governor, no, it's not going to happen. It's, it's one of the most audacious plans that I know of in the country <clears throat> that for the last 30 years the intent has been to create an artificial scarcity of land in a state that is basically nothing but land, an artificial scarcity of road capacity, especially highways and bridges, except bridges for light rail, and uh, <clears throat> to try and get you to switch from whatever you drive to, to more of a long line of a bike or walking or a skateboard, whatever is your preference. And if you don't like it, <clears throat> they just really don't care. Now, when I say that, you might think that uh, I've gone a little too far over the edge, I, that I used to be nice and now I'm not. But the fact is there is a, a, a big strategy for the region it's called the Metro 2040 Concept Plan. It's sort of a religious icon over at Metro. Everywhere you walk in the aisles or rooms, there's a 2040 map. And I don't know if they get out little mats and pray to it five times a day or what. But uh, you know, everything is, everything is dominated by the Metro 2040 Plan that was adopted by the Metro Council in December 1995. And the whole point of the plan is to have a very constrained physical limit on the size of the region, that is the urban growth boundary, will hardly ever expand. They will, by design, make congestion hundreds of percents worse than it was in 1995. That was known, that was in the plan. That housing affordability would, would greatly diminish, <clears throat> that the not, amount of money needed to subsidize homes would have to go up. There would be a, an artificial scarcity of, of land available for housing and big backyards would go away and you'd see a lot more row houses and skinny houses. That was all in the plan, it was known. 
And so what you might view as a bug, they would consider it's a feature. So I'm going to go into this in more depth. And I just want to say that I, especially because I was head of the Oregon Environmental Council from 1980 to 1996, back then I was considered s smart because I ran OEC and I was considered kind of one of the good guys. So I got invited to serve on a lot of task forces and commissions and advisory committees. I had friends who were <clears throat> running things over in Metro. I played, actually still play in recreational sports leagues with people who are important over in Metro. I know, and, and same with DEQ, I know them very well. I understand the way they think. Now that I'm a Cascade, I'm not smart anymore. Uh, so I don't get invited to serve on task forces or meetings, et cetera, et cetera. So when I look back at it now, um, I, I understand what they're trying to do. And my goal today is to try and give you some insights into what's happening and what potentially you could do about it. I want to focus to start on the Selwood Bridge reconstruction, partly because I have a 15,000 word case study research paper coming out in about two weeks, in which I took a deep dive into the Selwood Bridge. I, I started, and, and what they, I would say the Selwood was a, a great opportunity for um, <clears throat> the Metro Portland people to do what they call integrated land use and transportation planning and to impose their vision on the rest of us. Um, the Selwood, <clears throat> as you may know, um, opened in 1925. It was part of a bridge building uh, spate that hasn't been matched since. In a period of a decade, they built four new, four new bridges in the Portland region. And uh, they were advised at the time to make it a four-lane bridge, but they had a budget issue, so they only made it a two-lane bridge. And it was built for $540,000, which would still be a bargain in today's dollars. It would be about $8 million or so. The new Selwood cost about $328 million. And uh, the Selwood, at the time, back by the turn of the century, was the busiest two-lane bridge in the state of Oregon. It had about 31,000 average daily trips per day over it. And because of a slow-moving uh, landslide on the west side, <clears throat> it was it needed to be replaced. So we went out one day just before. I wanted to get some baseline data before they blew it up. So we went out and did some counts on the bridge at peak hour in the morning. And we said, well, it's interesting. If you count every car both ways and every person in the car and every walker or cyclist, it turns out that 98% of all the passenger trips in a passenger trip is different from a vehicle trip and that one person in one car is a vehicle trip. If there's three people in the car, it's still one vehicle trip, but it's three passenger trips. So 98% of the passenger trips in the morning peak were in a motor vehicle, and 2% were by walking or cycling. Now, admittedly, the sidewalk was only four feet, three inches wide, so I understand that. But it seemed odd to me that the de approved design for the new bridge was going to have more than 60% of the, of the throughput, the right-of-way, <clears throat> designed for non-automotive uses. I have nothing against sidewalks and, and bikeways. I'm an a active pedestrian. I'm a long-distance backpacker. I, I bicycle for fun occasionally. Um, but it seems to me um, having 60% of the right-of-way for only 2% of the throughput seemed a little skewed. And so I, I brought something about that, and it caused some, a big pushback in some quarters. And I said, well, they're, they're, I'll just wait. I mean, I'm not going anywhere. The answer will reveal itself after the bridge is built. I, I, it's not like I could stop the, the design or anything. The bridge that Deb Kafori and Ted Wheeler and the Metro people wanted was built. And then um, in 2016, when it opened, we started monitoring. And in 2017, it, well, in 2016, only one, one sidewalk and one bikeway was open. In 2017, the whole thing opened. In 2018, so we went out and monitored um, dozens of times at all hours of the day and night. We just counted and counted and counted. I tell people who work for me, you're not passing judgment here. It's not your job to decide what's right. It's just your job to count. So we just counted. Pretty easy to do, really, if you're willing to get up early and go sit, sit there. 
in all kinds of weather. And <clears throat> so the, the paper that we're publishing is, is showing that, in fact, um, all the promises that were made um, were wrong. Congestion is worse than before. Uh, it's not a multimodal bridge. Heavy trucks are not allowed. Bus service is far worse than before. And what's interesting is to me in the course of doing the research, I went back and, and uh, found an obscure study that I was vaguely aware about back in the day uh, regarding, it's called the South Corridor um, Crossing Study. It was published by Metro in <clears throat> 1999. And uh, they, they looked at all the bridges from the Markham Bridge south to Oregon City. And they forecasted that by 2015, unless something was done, the congestion on all those bridges would be considered, quote, unacceptable or grossly unacceptable. So as a result, they looked for potential new bridges south of the Selwood, say a bridge connecting Lake Oswego to uh, Milwaukee. They looked at about 17 potential crossings. And they decided that none of them would get built. And they decided that the Selwood Bridge, when it was rebuilt, should only be two lanes, not four lanes. So they decided instead the emphasis would be on something called TDM, Transportation Demand Management, which is just a bureaucratic phrase that's been around for decades. <clears throat> it's now subsumed in something called RTO, Regional Travel Options. And if you ever start hanging around Metro, uh, you, you need a whole book uh, sum to summarize all the acronyms they have of their bureaucratic programs. But RTO, TDM, it's all the same. It just means that they're going to spend a lot of money educating you, re-educating you on why you shouldn't drive and why you should do something else. And they're going to sponsor a uh, contest and they're going <clears> to <throat> promote laws, which we already have in Oregon, that if you're a large employer, you, you have to engage in sort of this nanny, nanny effect of, of hounding your employees to you know, drive less. There's a whole ad campaign called Drive Less, Save More that the legislature paid for as if you didn't already know that if you drove less, you could save more. So they considered TDM to be the functional equivalent of actually providing road capacity. And they, they sort of said in passing, well, you know, we probably should do something about 224 and I-205, et cetera, and you know, that, that'll solve the problem. And then they moved on. And so that set the phase to the tone for Portland a couple years later in 2001 doing this intensive study of the Tacoma Street Selwood Bridge area and deciding they were going to pose a road diet. Uh, Tacoma Street at the time it was two lanes, 20 hours a day, and four lanes, four hours a day, the peak period. So you, when you came off the bridge or went on the bridge at the peak, you actually had four lanes. So they decided that was bad. We're going to have a road diet and downsize it to, to just two. And uh, so by the time the, the Selwood Bridge got rebuilt, the road diet on Tacoma actually foreclosed any option of building a four-lane bridge. You couldn't, you couldn't make it work. So what's interesting to me is uh, Lynn, like Lynn Peterson, who's now the head of Metro, she was, she's an engineer. She was the transportation modeler on the 1999 study. She accurately predicted that we would have grossly unacceptable levels of congestion by 2015 if we did nothing. Martha Bennett, who is the second in command over at Metro, <clears throat> was in 1999 working as the administrator of the city of Milwaukee, and she was on a project steering group for this same study. So the two women who are most powerful at Metro today were intimately involved in this 1999 study, predicting that if we do nothing, we will have grossly unacceptable levels of congestion. And then they knowingly decided that that would become acceptable, that they would just do nothing, that this would be the perfect opportunity to impose their preferences on the rest of the region and just do nothing. So that was kind of shocking to me when I read that and to, and to look how many people, including others who are still active, Susan McLean, who is then on the Metro Council, she's a, she's a state legislator, <clears throat> Rob Monroe, who only recently retired from politics, he was the presiding officer of Metro, a lot of people they, they all knowingly decided to make the congestion situation worse down there. It's kind of like being on a school board and you have a prediction that if you don't expand classrooms and hire more teachers in some time frame, you'll just have 40 and 50 kids and they'll be sitting on the floor, et cetera, and you say, yeah, that's cool, that's what we'll do. I mean, who would do that in any other context? 
But at Metro, they do it. Not even news. Not even news. So that's what happened. They knowingly created a disaster. They spent a lot of money on the disaster. And after you go monitor it thousands of times, uh, thousands of trips like, like we have, <clears throat> what you conclude is that, yeah, it, it is, it's a nice bridge. It's beautiful. If we have a big earthquake, it might be the only surviving standing bridge left. I have no criticism of the engineers who worked on it. And I, I enjoy walking across it. But uh, you, didn't, you didn't need all that space, the 12-foot sidewalks and the six-foot bike lanes. You would, could have gotten the same results, basically, by having half of that space. And as far as TriMed, providing only one bus across the bridge, rather than the two that used to be there at a time when TriMet's budget over the last 20 years, operating budget in real terms, has gone up by 88%. And they, I mean, they're literally swimming in cash. I mean, that's just inexcusable. And trucks are not allowed. And then meanwhile, after that, notwithstanding that they decided no new bridges, <clears throat> they, that only mattered for motorists, because what opened in 2015? Oh yeah, the Telecom Crossing. That new bridge for 150, $160 million, that bridge is OK. And no cars and trucks are allowed on that bridge. So here we have the t a city in which it doesn't matter whether you buy organic produce or free range kale or whatever. Uh, <laughs> everything is delivered in a truck. And the two most recent bridges <coughs> built in this city are not open to trucks, as if they're just going to magically, what, stop, stop operating? No, they're just going to go out of, out of distance to go over some other bridge, creating more pollution, causing more, uh, more emissions, and costing more money. I mean, it's really childish to me that, that we do that, and that no one's embarrassed by it. So to me, that's a classic case of, a, of what goes on in Portland. But there's way more, and there's a lot happening right now that I want to touch on, and then we'll kind of circle back and I'll talk about some things you might do if you wish to. You may know that uh, we spent probably $200 million over a 17 year period talking about and planning for a new bridge on I-5 over the Columbia River. <clears throat> it had multiple names. I was involved for all 17 years. There were three different advisory committees, and it was once called the I-5 Trade Partnership, became known more infamously as the Columbia River Crossing Project. <clears throat> it was always uh, about extending light rail to Vancouver. That was the whole point. Everything else was kind of a misdirection ploy. So the CRC died, fortunately, about five years ago. Now the governor is trying to restart it. Well, uh, my view, first of all, is that light rail was a nice idea to try in 19, the 1970s. I personally was excited when it opened in 1986. I actually moved from downtown Portland to, uh, I bought a house out on the Sandy River in 1995, largely because I wanted to be a light rail commuter into downtown Portland, which is kind of embarrassing to admit that one of the most important things you would do in your whole life, buy a house, that I would do that based on where does light rail go? It's kind of silly. Light rail doesn't even go to Sandy. I, what I, where I bought was 20, 20 miles beyond. So when I started commuting, I would drive 20 miles to Gresham at the end of the line and take all the way downtown. And it wasn't until I'd done this 500 times or so, and when you sit there traveling at about 14 miles an hour, you have a lot of time to think about, why isn't this working very well? See, I'd been a, a rail commuter from New Jersey into New York earlier in my career, and I thought I was going to get that. That was a commuter rail. That was a real rail system. Light rail isn't that at all. So I went from being a light rail supporter to a light rail critic, precisely because I became a light rail commuter. So I decided a long time ago that that, that was a nice try. We should have stopped after the first two lines and you know, grown up, moved on. But the governor's still obsessed with punching light rail over to Vancouver. <clears throat> so she's rebranding it. It's no longer the CRC or CRC 2.0. It's, it's the IRB, I think, the Interstate Replacement Bridge. But it's the same dumb idea. And I went to a hearing. Unfortunately, there's at least one legislator over in Vancouver who said, look, uh, maybe we should replace the, the I-5 bridge. It's functionally obsolete. It's not the safest thing around, even though it's not in any danger of collapsing. But we need multiple bridges. 
And that, that to me is what you, the takeaway for this group should be. Uh, I, replacing I-5 is not a crisis. Getting a bridge upriver from the Glen Jackson Bridge, maybe from Troutdale over to East Vancouver, and another bridge downriver of I-5 that would allow a west side bypass to be built. To go from two to four bridges, now that would be worth doing. And if you did that, and then you decided, okay, now we'll replace the I-5 bridge because it's obsolete. Okay, sure, cool, go for it. But if we're gonna fight for the next 20 years over just replacing the I-5 bridge, and at the end we just have two bridges, no, that to me is a complete waste of time and money. And you should just oppose that flat out, I personally think. We have the I-5 corridor, Rose, the I-5 uh, Rose Quarter expansion going on that's actually earmarked in a bill passed last session, so, so it's probably going to happen whether some people like it or not, but there's been a lot of pushback about ODOT <clears throat> their plan to have some auxiliary lanes in what is the most congested corridor in the whole state, I-5 from basically I-84 up to the Fremont Bridge, where you have three lanes going down to two, so it doesn't work. And there's a uh, Metro has been criticizing it, and a group called nomorefreeways.com has been criticizing it, and a lot of people are sort of piling on. And uh, I personally think that their criticism is misguided. I certainly agree that you would not want to just build lanes endlessly and create some kind of 16-lane monstrosity like the New Jersey Turnpike in New Jersey where I grew up. That's kind of gross. And, um, but to add some auxiliary lanes, uh, to me, is necessary. And frankly, ODOT's got the data to show it. If any of you ever take Highway 217 south all the way to I-5 and then get on I-5 and go south towards Tualatin and then 205, they just finished an auxiliary lane expansion in that area. And <clears throat> the data shows that what used to be five hours of congestion is down to one. And I drive that quarter all the time, and it really is markedly much, much better. And that's really what they're proposing for the I-5 um, Rose Quarter area. And so there are some people, led by Joe Courtright, who's an economist, who keeps whining about this thing called induced demand, that if you just provide <clears throat> more capacity, people will just drive more, and you'll never, ever solve a congestion problem by doing that. Now, as an economist, he should know that the, the problem really is not that you provide more capacity, it's that you're providing uh, capacity that isn't priced. That is at the point of consumption, people perceive it to be free. That's, that is what induces demand. It would be the same as saying, if you go into Fred Meyer right now, there might be 80,000 products, and they all have a price. And what keeps you from running around like a maniac, grabbing stuff off the shelves and putting it into your, your uh, storage, your bin there, is the fact that there's a price. But if we decided that it would all be free at the point of consumption, and we would reimburse Fred Meyer later uh, through a property tax increase, okay, now that'd be crazy. Just imagine, you go in, it's all free, 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 it's great, it's great, and you just run around and you grab stuff. Because, look, if you don't consume more, your property taxes are going to go up anyway. The only way you can get ahead is to, is to out-consume your neighbor. You know, it's kind of the all-you-can-eat buffet thing. Once you've paid, once you've paid, you may as well just eat. You don't go through the line just once if you've already paid. You go through two or three times until, in some cases, you get sick. So, but Joe keeps forgetting that we already have congestion pricing coming on the I-5 corridor. So if we expand the capacity, plus we have peak hour pricing, then the, what will limit people's interest in driving a lot is the fact that they're going to pay by the mile and, by the, and the price will vary by the hour. So there's a lot of criticism of that project. I think it's a good project. It's already in the law to be paid for, and I think it will proceed. Speaking of value pricing, by the way, ODOT just finished something that was also mandated in a law last year, that they were required to look at potential, well, the value pricing is another name for congestion pricing, which is another name for electronic tolling with peak hour pricing. So that's really similar to the notion of matinee pricing or off-season pricing at resorts or happy hour pricing at a restaurant, anything that might induce you to change your point of consumption, your behavior because of a price differential, blazer tickets, I'm sure all the sports tickets in every major league park around the country 
uh, are now priced differentially. That the really good teams have a premium price, and the dog teams have a discount price. And um, <clears throat> so ODOT was required in a law passed two years ago to <coughs> consider pricing on I-5 and 205. I personally thought it would be really more effective to price the entire limited access highway system, but not the surface streets, the highway system as a whole, as an integrated whole, to lower the gas tax, to lower your vehicle registration fees, and to move all the, the real cost to just electronic tolling to give you a real incentive to drive thoughtfully and um, carefully, not overconsume, <clears throat> but in return, when you would drive under peak hour pricing, you would get something you really, really want, which is to go fast all the time. You sell speed, reliability. And in those facilities that have already been priced like this, there's an I, uh, SR91 down in California has been priced since 1995. It's a four-lane, 10-mile expressway. It uh, has 14, diff 14 different price points and varies by time of day, direction of travel, and day of the week. Uh, what they sell is speed and reliability. And when you go on it, you always get to go fast, all the time, any direction, any day of the week. That's what you're buying. And I think if you gave motorists in Portland an experience where they could always go 40 to 45 or 50 all the time, any day of the week, any direction of travel, and they, you, they had that for just a short period of time, they would never want to go back to the current system today where it's random, you have to build in all this extra time, and if you get lucky and get somewhere without congestion, now you're sitting at the other end of your trip with 40 extra minutes, all of the nonsense that you experience all the time. ODOT, the recommendation they, they chose is, is to, that they are applying to the feds for permission to toll part of I-5 and a tiny little part of I-5 down by Oregon City, which I don't really get that. I'm a big proponent of electronic tolling and peak hour pricing. As long as you start to lower other taxes, and you do it in a way that would actually give people what they want. And I don't see how tolling one little bridge in Oregon City is gonna do it. So uh, I've taken a lot of grief from my own donors, and conservatives and libertarians, a lot of them just have this knee-jerk reaction against, against any, any new, what they call tax, what I call user fee. But I'm not going to defend uh, what ODOT has done. They, it was not put forward in a way that I thought was defensible, so I won't. I think eventually we, you will see Ubiquitous electronic tolling, just not in the next decade or two. You also have the Southwest Corridor Project, the next uh, big wasteful light rail project. And I thought the Milwaukee project was pretty expensive, $1.5 billion, $211 million per mile capital cost, which uh, if that number doesn't mean anything to you, it would only mean something if I said to you $211 million a mile. I'll give you 30 days to study the economics of rubber tired road-based transit. <clears throat> and if you can come up with a way to move people in a, some kind of bus or jitney or Uber vehicle or something, some up a plan to move people, for every dollar that you save under $210 million a mile, uh, your favorite charity gets 40% you know, of the savings. If you were incentivized to learn about the economics of light rail compared to what? That's always the question. Light rail compared to what? you would probably discover that no matter what rubber tired alternative you tried, if you bought the, the best buses in the history of humanity, the kind of buses that rock stars tore on, if you, had, if you paid great wages to the new bus drivers you would need, if you had onboard Wi-Fi and, and, and TVs everywhere and NFL Direct and free coffee and donuts and the Wall Street Journal in the morning, you couldn't spend it all. You actually cannot spend $211 million a mile on rubber-tired road-based transit. It's, it's just unbelievable. So we built this slow train to the middle of nowhere on 99E, south of, of Milwaukee, and it's trying its worst performing line. It's a ghost ship. But we're gonna do something even dumber now. We're gonna build a project ending at Bridgeport Village, which is a great place. I like shopping there. It's completely auto-oriented. And it's like a Gresham Station here in Gresham, which I saw go up when I was a commuter on the train. I saw it get built the whole time. A light rail station to Gresham Station, and the train does nothing. Or a light rail to um, Cascade Station out in, by the airport, which did nothing until uh, Ikea opened. 
and uh, people don't, don't go to Ikea and shop and bring home bunches of stuff on the train. <clears throat> Clackamas Town Center, the green line ends there. This is all supposed to change the way people travel. You know, a big zero for all those. So now we have the Southwest Quarter Project at uh, about $2.6 billion for a 12-mile train. Hundreds of properties to be eliminated, businesses to be relocated. And uh, <clears throat> there was a you know, hearing in the legislature just a couple days ago which I testified at, a bill buried deep in the process. The average person would have no way of knowing this bill is even happening. The governor has a bill to include $27 million of bond funding for that project, backed by what's called lottery-backed bonds. They'll sell bonds <clears throat> to be repaid with future lottery revenue. And then that's in the printed bill. What the analyst said, which I didn't even know, was, oh, that's just part one. Next session, she's going to ask for $125 million. So $152 million for this train from lottery-backed bonds. That actually hasn't happened yet. If you wanted to weigh in on that, I could talk to you later about how to do that. So that's still going. And then Metro has a new transportation funding task force for a bond measure on the 2020 ballot, which will be the third one in a row. Last year was the low-income public housing project measure that passed. The one coming out this fall will be for another land grab for their big nature park program. And then next year will be a, the biggest one of all, will be their transportation funding task force, which they'll ask for $850 million to be raised by your property taxes for the light rail project to Bridgeport Village. And it's, it'll be structured as that's the Christmas tree and then they'll hang a whole bunch of ornaments on the tree, bike, bikey walkie projects, and uh, other stuff that this 39-person task force they've created is supposed to come up with. And the hope is that if you put enough ornaments on the tree, people will vote yes on the whole thing, even if they maybe are underwhelmed by the idea of $850 million for another slow train to nowhere. So the Transportation Task Force is meeting. It meets about, I don't know, once every three weeks. They have a meeting on the 24th coming up. And uh, you know, if you are interested in that, that's, that's a happening conversation. And uh, you know, there are 39 people who are being basically used by Metro to run interference. And, and uh, my, I hypothesize that if you took the light rail project out of that whole thing right now and put it over here, the task force would cease to ever convene again because the whole point of the task force is to find a way to fund light rail. That's it. So um, the final thing you might know, find it interesting, there was a hearing yesterday where the legislative committee was, was sort of uh, grilling a person at, at ODOT who has the unlucky job of running the Willamette Valley passenger rail line. Actually, Amtrak runs it on contract. But twice a day, you can go from uh, Oregon City or Portland down to Eugene on the Amtrak, or Cascades Line, it's called. It's another ghost ship. It basically has almost no riders. It's kind of fun. I like it. I, I love trains. Um, it's not very practical. So every two years, the Ways and Means Committee, when they're asked to put in another $10 million, typically, they ask a certain number of questions. They get frustrated. And then in the end, they give them the money anyway. Um, and so they were asking yesterday, and the poor bureaucrat gets dragged up for this ritual kind of thrashing he gets, where he has to admit, what's the, what's the all-in subsidy? So he admitted that the all-in subsidy was $100.60. And someone said, so is that one way or a round trip? And he said, well, we don't know. So about three different people on the committee kept asking him, OK, now look, uh, I go from Eugene to Portland one way. Senator so-and-so next to me goes, Eugene to Portland round trip. Is the subsidy different? And the, the person from ODOT says, well, we don't really know. We, we can't calculate that. Everyone's kind of rolling their eyes, like, really? Maybe this explains part of the problem here, that all this money is sloshing around, and you can't tell us what the subsidy per trip is or per mile. But it's a big number anyway. And uh, so they started talking about, well, the $10 million you ask, is, is it likely that if no matter how many riders you had, the $10 million subsidy would go on forever? And he said, well, basically, yes. So I've been part of that conversation for at least a decade. When Betsy Johnson, Senator Johnson, when, when she used to co-chair that committee, she made it a lot more entertaining. She used to just blow a cork on this whole thing. But she's up higher now. She's not on that committee. And um, 
so they, they are considering actually euthanizing the whole project, but that would require paying back some federal money and selling off some train sets and doing some other things, which they don't like enjoy doing. Legislators like to spend money, they like to collect money, they like to build monuments to themselves. They don't like euthanizing projects and, admit, and admitting that they made a mistake. So I'm pretty sure at the end, they'll, they'll just roll out the money because it's, it's only your money. So what do they care? Uh, but that's happening. If you wanted to express an opinion about that, I can tell you later how to do that. So I'm in the 36 minutes and 54 seconds now, so I should probably wind down soon. So let me just tell you a couple of things. We have a systemic problem, in, in my opinion, which is that the road, surface road system, and the transit system are run as government monopolies. And monopolies in any sector are generally considered to be undesirable, and government monopolies are especially undesirable, in my view, because you have no other option. <clears throat> And they have no real incentive to make you happy. I mean, I can tell you, at TriMet, they get so much money from the payroll tax, and now the new employee tax, this part of, comes out of your paycheck, they have so much money from that that actually making you happy as a customer is irrelevant to them. Their, their pay, the revenue they get from actual customers is, is maybe 5 or 10% of their total income stream for the year. So you're just not even relevant to them. So you say you're mad, they say, fine, go, we leave us alone. I mean, it's not like you running your own business and you have a whole bunch of people who come in and say they're mad. You're going to take that seriously. So uh, there's probably no chance of uh, privatizing the road system, but we could allow new highways to be built with, by private investors. There are, there's investment money all over the world looking to do that. Theoretically, one could do that in Portland, but probably won't happen. I actually tested a couple years ago, Rob Blumenauer, oddly, invited me to speak at a conference he put on in Portland State, which had about 300 people there. And he wanted me to take the position that the federal government should basically get out of transportation. <clears throat> he didn't want to take that position, but he knew I would, so he asked me to come and speak. So I did, and I said, look, it's not just about money, it's about an attitude adjustment. I said, what if uh, a private consortium came in and said, we will build a new bridge from East Vancouver to Gresham or Troutdale, an alternative to the Glen Jackson Bridge. It'll be privately financed told. If you don't like it, you don't have to go on it. You can go on the Glen Jackson. It's free. All we need is permit. We don't need any public money. We just need permission to hook up to I-84. And I said, so they go over to Metro and ODOT and the other bureaucracies. It'll take you know dozens of permits to get all this done. And they, they tell the story. Uh, no public subsidy. We just want to hook up. I said, you know what the answer would be over at Metro where they all hang out? I said, no. Or hell no. <laughs> I said, it's not money. <laughs> I said, what, what we need in this region is an attitude adjustment that mobility is a good thing. So there's hundreds of people in the room, all representing all of these agencies and the whole politically correct in crowd. Not a single person stood up to tell me I was wrong, either during the speech or after the speech, because they know I'm right. <laughs> that it's not just money. It's that. As long as they have you trapped with the only two bridges across the Columbia, why would they give you a third? It's an attitude problem. Uh, what's interesting to me is the ride hailing revolution. It was only about five years ago, maybe less, that Uber and Lyft started coming into the Portland market. And Uber and Lyft were legal in, I think, Beaverton and Vancouver, maybe Gresham, but not Portland. And Mayor Hales and, and uh, Steve Novick, the transportation commissioner, was, were, made a big deal, a halt. No, you can't come in here. We have a taxi, what I call the taxi cartel, uh, <clears throat> four or five taxi companies with licenses and run by the city, and you can't compete against them. And it's all a little cozy little arrangement. And uh, they're saying, it's kind of hilarious. I felt like, why don't you go out to the coast and tell the waves, stop, you're not coming in. <laughs> you know, like, so uh, within six months, Charlie was uh, you know, down on his knees pretty much begging for forgiveness. So all, it, Uber, everyone had a phone, a smartphone. I mean, Uber and Lyft just invaded the city, and you, they couldn't be stopped. And so now you know, they're, they're part of the regulatory scene. They're, that's an example of how technology, consumer um, sovereignty, uh, willingness to pay, markets, uh, all led to a revolution, which Uber did not even exist in 2009. And today, you know. Uh, well, Lyft just went public, IPO. Uber maybe either has or is about to, <clears throat> valued at many billions of dollars. Lots of people use them. They don't get subsidized. There is congestion pricing. It's called surge pricing. 
and they take you from where you are to where you want to go, door-to-door -door service. Well, to me, that, that there's no coincidence that 2012 was TriMet's peak year for ridership. It's all in a free, free fall, and they can't figure out why. Um, so I think there's a lesson there, which markets work always. Markets work in transportation if we allow them. The city of Portland did try and disallow it, but they were run over. That was great, great thing for consumers. And I would say that going forward, the home court advantage that Metro has is that no one really understands who they are, what they do, where their money comes from. You know, if you, if you have a complaint as a citizen, you know how to find probably your mayor, your city council person. You know what a county commission is, vaguely. You probably can't find one person in 100 on the streets who can explain to you what Metro does, where they are, where they're physically located, where is the Metro office, how does the money come from, or where does it come from, how does it flow? And Metro loves that. They love having the power while being essentially anonymous. So um, I'd suggest that you know, there are probably two Metro commissioners who have a big, <clears throat> who could be influenced by you, Shirley Craddock, Christine Lewis, the East Siders. I suggest you have a conversation with them sometime about, first of all, the Metro 2040 plan, you know, the religious icon, is now 24 years old. I don't think it's asking too much to say, could we do a little check-in here? How's it working? <laughs> what was promised in 1995 and what is actually being delivered? I don't think that's unreasonable. Although I can tell you, if you go on the Metro website and look at the auditor's reports, you can find in the last decade four auditor, and the auditor is independently elected and has his or her own budget, has published four reports issuing scathing criticisms of Metro's transportation program, essentially saying, you people live in a world of computer models with no feedback. You need some real data and you need to validate what your plans say versus what's actually happening out there. Four times they published audits, four times the auditor's been told to go back in his cave and the Metro Council goes on with their business as usual. There's a lot to be pursued there and you might want to have that conversation with Councilor Craddock or Councilor Lewis. Um, TriMet, every December, the TriMet board gets ready to increase the payroll tax rate. If you're a business owner, you pay it, probably, unless you want to have the little exemptions. <clears throat> and um, the reason they do that is because the legislature in 2003 and again in 2009 authorized TriMet to raise the payroll tax rate over a 10-year period. So they are they planning to implement that increase every year until 2024. And the only reason they get away with it is because the business community uh, is codependent with them. When I tried to get uh, various chambers in 03 and 09 to oppose that, I couldn't get anybody. Portland Business Alliance, Westside Economic Alliance, Central East Side Industrial Council. I don't know what you folks were doing. I probably didn't talk to you, but <clears throat> most of the chambers were on board with taxing their own members for more TriMet money. Well, you know, every year they have to go through this little drill of an ordinance to, to raise the payroll tax rate. That might be a little test for you to see what happens if you go in and say, no, your membership peaked in 2012. It's now like this. Your revenue is going like this. So until you can show us there's some correlation between more money and ridership, we're not going to support any more payroll tax rate increases. And you might want to call the TriMet people and ask them to come over and talk to you sometime about that. It would be a very enlightening conversation. So I'll just wrap up by saying there are things you can do if you are dissatisfied with the status quo. They would be difficult. Um, both Metro and TriMet, all the agencies bank on the fact that you're rationally very busy with your personal lives and your kids and your jobs and families and you only have so much bandwidth to pay attention to all of this. But if you decide as an entity, as, a <clears throat> as business people, to, to focus on one or two things and to actually make a, take a deep dive, um, you might find them paying attention to you. It might be pretty educational. So thanks for your time. I'd be happy to answer questions. I'm new, not new, I grew up here and then I've been away. I'm not sure why I'm not that. 
We need it for the TV. I could probably get away with uh, not understanding. I'm ignorant to how do Metro people get elected? How do they stay elected? Are they appointed? <laughs> there are seven now seven Metro councilors. When I moved here, it was 12 or 13. But <clears throat> some kind of ballot measure passed around 2000 that changed. So there's seven, <clears throat> six by district. So the two I mentioned, Christine Lewis, Shirley Craddock are the East Siders. And then the current presiding officer, uh, Lynn Peterson, he is elected region wide. So she's full time, the others are part time, and they draw a salary, uh, a nice salary for part time work. The council meets twice a week, once Tuesday on work session and Thursday typically on um, days to, to, to pass ordinances, business meetings. They're headquartered on Grand Avenue in east side of Portland. They have probably 800 people who work for them. They also run the zoo, they run the convention center, they run a lot of things. They set garbage rates. Um, and uh, I would say the Metro councilors are important to pay attention to, but by and large, they are manipulated by the permanent staff. That's really the way it works at a place like DEQ or a school district or uh, any place. The people up above who get elected, <clears throat> they like to think they're in charge, but from the, atti the attitude of the lifers who work in the bureaucracy, their attitude, and they'll say this pretty much directly, we're here forever. You all, you come and go. So elected officials are important to interact with, but the battle is won and lost at the bureaucratic level because the people who control the agenda, who control the black box of calculations, who control the flow of information, they're all the unappointed people working down at these various levels. And that is what makes Metro, Metro, TriMet, the whole group over there so challenging is that they're kind of anonymous, they're smart, they, they work pretty hard, they have a lot of money, and um, they're controlling the flow of information. One other question, you said TriMet uh, raises the business rate on their own. I don't quite understand how <coughs> they're able to take a tax rate up at TriMet. When uh, private transit was put out, put out of business in the late 60s in this region, Rose City Transit and some other transit entities, because at the time, transit was a private, for-profit, property tax paying, dividend paying enterprise. So the city of Portland deliberately put private transit out of business by refusing to allow a, a nickel increase. And then the 69 legislature created TriMet and authorized for TriMet and Lane Transit Districts, just those two, the ability to implement a payroll tax. And that tax, and the tax rate has gone up over time. And increasingly, the payroll tax has become the dominant revenue stream for TriMet. So passenger fares are increasingly a small part so the rate is capped by the legislature. And in 2003, and again in 2009, <clears throat> TriMet went down to the Capitol and successfully lobbied and said, we can't get the feds to put in money for all of our light rail programs going forward unless we have the capacity to borrow bonds from Wall Street to be paid back by our payroll tax revenue for our local share, because the feds will only put in 50 or 60% of the capital construction costs. So the payroll tax rate has been authorized by the legislature to go up twice over a 10-year period. So the first one has already expired, 2015. The second one will expire in 2024. And that money um, basically is, enables TriMet to continue to build their light rail program. So this is a little bit off topic, but um, regarding the um, UGB and the metros process that they followed this last time uh, to expand the urban growth boundary, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that, if that's a new way of thinking, how you, um, how you see their positive response to the four city asks, just things like regarding that, because that seemed to be a real deviation from how they proceeded before. Yeah, I mean, the four city ask was, was pretty minor and they felt, for whatever reason, that they probably needed to say yes. They, they do acknowledge that you can't have a wall around a region and never expand it. But, but by and large, the, the, the state law that says you have to have a 20-year supply of land is like an accordion 
well, 20 years of life to find that. What are, your, what are your assumptions? If you stack and pack people enough in high rises, you can make 20 years supply go for a really long period of time. If you pretend we're Manhattan Island, um, you don't need much land. So they always manipulate that. Um, and frankly, the urban growth boundary, which is a very seductive idea that I once believed in, um, it, it, as soon as you create it, it creates political tension every square, along every square inch. People who are just outside the boundary but have urban amenities think it's awesome, but they, don't, they certainly don't want you ex expanding it past them. And so you have all these built-in fights. And so the, the boundary is a nice idea that didn't work, but it is state law. And uh, the Metroids believe that they can make it work. And occasionally they throw people a bone and expand it. But their intent and the 2040 plan is designed to, the, mo the mantra back then and still is, grow up, not out. But if you talk to anyone who's in the construction business, and if you, if you actually examine the way things work, building up rather than out is just much more expensive per unit, per square foot, per anything. And the only way you build up, the only reason you would build up especially if you're talking cranes and uh, iron workers and steel and uh, underground parking. That's way, way, way expensive. The only reason you do that is when the underlying dirt is so expensive that it pays to go up. So from Metro's standpoint, expanding the urban growth boundary and keeping the price of dirt cheap is not what they want. They want the dirt to be expensive to, to justify building up because they want you in a apartment, not in a single family home. So I, again, it's quite audacious. And you find out if you are selling a home and it has a big lot, typically um, you can sell it to people from Los Angeles and San Francisco, sight unseen, who don't even care about the house. All they want was the big backyard, because under local government rules, a lot of that can be um, built in with, with higher density housing. <clears throat> because they've created this notion that we're land scarce in a state that is gigantic and which almost nobody lives here and somehow we've magically created a scarcity of land is this like a, a miracle of planning so well, thank you thank you i'll stick around and around talk if you if you want and uh, thanks for listening so take advantage of the opportunity to uh, talk further uh, with john um, at this point, we are out of time, and I want to try to get everyone out of here who needs to get out of here on time. Thank you again to our sponsors, uh, Portland General Electric, Columbia Bank, uh, Gresham Barlow School District, and Metro East Community Media. Uh, be sure and pick up a replay schedule for Metro East uh, so you can refresh yourself on all you heard, um, and it's right out on the table. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day.